sometimes, and I was corrected this morning by my daughter and my son and Jane, <laughs> and I just walked out of the room and walked down the hall and said, they just need to shut up. <laughs> just kidding. I didn't say that. But when you're looking, when you when you're looking at society, when you're looking at different things, and I'll just tell you what happened. Jessica was showing a video of a song that she wanted us to go back and sing, and it's "My God Is an Awesome God." And the uh, teachers and the students in the class were doing it, you know, Acapulco. <laughs> yeah, it's okay to laugh. I know I, I know what I said. Anyway, but my my perception of what I saw is yes, God is an awesome God. And I looked at Jane, and you know, uh, I'm not sure Jeremy was up here at that necessarily at that time, but Jessica was. Were you up there, Jeremy? No. Okay. Well, anyway, I, I looked at him and I said, "And you know what the shame of all that is? They don't believe a word they're saying. They're excited. Yes, our God is an awesome God, but when they walk right outside and they're hit with the world, they fold. And it's the church's fault." The reason the nation is in the spot it's in, it's the church's fault. You were talking about somebody was out mowing their grass and we're not concentrating on the Lord. Well, the reason we're not concentrating on the Lord is because it's so much work, it's so much effort, and there's no benefit from it, so nobody wants to do it. That's the fault of the church. It's our fault. So how do we change it? What, what do we do? Well, I know exactly what to do. And it's just what Paula talked about. It's just what you talked about. It's what, you know, Jessica and I talked about. And that's living your faith and letting other people see the results. Because when they see results, the motivation that causes them to get involved is a motivation that will cause them to stick to the Lord. Because they don't see the peace in their life. They don't see prosperity in their life. They don't see healing in their life. But they are seeing it in your life. And it takes a commitment on our part. But that commitment is not works. That commitment is to be still and know that God is who he says he is. And that's what we're learning to do. I mean, if you look around right now, there's not many people here. And I have, sometimes I have to deal with that. And sometimes the enemy comes against me and says, it's because you're not teaching the truth. And I go, well, I know that's not right. I know that's not right. But the issue is numbers. The issue isn't money. The issue isn't acceptance or popularity or fame it's it's the issue is are we making progress are we understanding are we are we really growing is our life really changing because before our life is going to change in the physical it's already changed in the spiritual because we've received Jesus and we're born again but we're going to have to change the way we think is our thinking changing because if our thinking is changing our dependence is changing. We've talked about faith having a chain reaction. Well, you know me. What do you think I have on this sheet of paper? Questions. <laughs> because I'm that guy. Oh, gosh. Don't ask. No, don't, no, don't take questions. Billy's out there. He's going to ask questions. So I have a question. One of many. Does God change? The scripture tells us, in him is no darkness, neither shadow of turning. God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So we need to get, if God never changes, why aren't we more successful? Now, God said some things. He said, I put an, an end to all debate because the Jews had, a, they, they had this issue that if one man swore in front of other men... It settled the issue. Well, God said, there's no one greater than I, and I swear by myself, blessing, I will bless you. I will take care of you. I will manifest my promises. Because if I don't, I'm a liar. And God said, it's impossible for me to lie. So if God doesn't change, 
The problem obviously lies with us, and that's not a condemnation, it's just the truth. Now, yes, there's a lot of extenuating circumstances. There's, and, and it's primarily the church and division and us not recognizing how the devil works, and that, again, is the responsibility of the clergy and the church. It's our responsibility ability, responsibility to relate to you proper ways to interpret what's going on in your life. See, slavery, slavery would never have happened. And I'm not talking about black slavery. Because I'm amazed at how teachers don't even know that black slavery was just a product of other slavery, slavery that was occurring for thousands of years before. See, slavery is not a color or racial issue. It's a weakness issue. When someone is stronger than you, they're going to take you into bondage because that's how the devil works. And he's the prince in power of, of the air. He's the prince in power of the social system in the earth. Black, white, red, yellow, all have been enslaved. All. And so you got to remember, too, uh, black slavery didn't occur until there was more wealth manifested where people could afford to go to another continent to get people and bring them back to their continent. So what did they do? The whites enslaved the whites, the Hispanics enslaved the Hispanics, or vice versa, depending who was in their area and who was the weakest. So don't get caught up in that. The narratives that you're being given are not even true. Slavery is a devil issue, period. And the churches should have come out immediately and condemned it all. But see, they were affected by it too. Because we read the scriptures, but we were blinded to the truth. We didn't see it. So I don't want to get off on a tangent there. I want to, I want to come back. So God doesn't change. So that means that we have to change. So God changed us on the spiritual level and then said, now be transformed by the renewing of your mind to who you are now, this new creature. So I'm asking you another question. Is God good? Okay, so he doesn't change, so he's good all the time. Okay, so do you believe God's good? Do you really? Because the answer is no. Because if you did, and you believe he didn't change, and he was good to you, you would not have any struggles. Meaning, not that you wouldn't have any battles, but you would be able to rest through those battles and come out on the other side unharmed. Do you see, you see what I'm saying? Your mind's not fully renewed. But see, what I'm trying to get us to see is we say things because we're programmed to say them, not because we believe them. We need to stop doing that. We'll say something negative, and then we'll go, well, I rebuke that. I don't receive that. Well, you're doing that because you're afraid. What you said came out of you. It doesn't mean you're bad or you're evil. It just means we're still renewing our minds. Does God love you? Yes, he does. That never changes. So let me start asking these questions. Do works you have done or sins you have committed change God's love for you. So you're going to need to solidify yourself, settle yourself in that. Yes or no. And I'm, I can't tell you what to do for you. I'm only going to give you the word and you're going to go from there. Does faith produce because of your works or God's promises? They produce because God made the promise, but you can't earn it. We've already proved through 6,000 years of human history that we know of that no man has ever been perfect. Are God's promises conditional? Are they based on your performance? Okay. We want to say no, but there's still some areas where we're obstructed from receiving because of our performance because we know we don't deserve something we weren't good enough we did this we lied we took that whatever it doesn't matter the ma the fact of the matter is the devil will remind you of your failures when you don't need him to and what god's trying to remind you of is when the devil does that he says cast those vain imaginations down for the ex they're exalting themselves against the word of god that says you have been forgiven do feelings and emotions have any effect on whether God is moving in your circumstances? 
So you have to solidify these things. You're going to have to renew your mind so you can't be pulled from a faith position. Is your belief affected by how you feel? Or is God affected by how you feel? Or by your negative thoughts? Is God limited by your negative thoughts? Are you limited by your negative thoughts? And when I say yours, they're in your head. Can you exercise faith even though there's negative thoughts in your head? Absolutely. See, it's what the heart man believes. And that'll change the way you think. Does God stop working for you until your good works catch up or your feelings come into line? No. No. But see, you have to accept that as a truth. You have to allow acceptance. You have to allow receiving. You have to allow yourself to receive, okay? Who and what determines how and when God works in behalf of his children? Who and what determines that? Who determines how God's going to move in behalf of his children? You are. God's not. God already told you what his will was. God's already given everything. Healing has been given. Prosperity has been given. Success has been given. Peace has been given. It's all been given. So you're the determining factor. So I'm going to read you something quickly, and then I'm going to go on. What if I had no idea what to do in my life to succeed. Whether it was work related, health related, family or relationship related, prosperity related, or in regards to mental peace. What if I had no clue of what to do? But what if I asked God to lead me and to show me in how to succeed in all these areas and believe that he would, what would happen? What would God do? Would he cause you to succeed in all these areas? What if you had no Bible, but you made those decisions? Would God be able to move in your life? Absolutely. Would God cause you to succeed in all those areas? Yes. But you have to decide that's the truth because that is the power of faith. See, Abraham didn't have a Bible, yet he's the father of faith. He didn't have a Bible. So I'm going to branch out here just a little bit. And I'm going to read you some more impossibles because here's what I want to talk to you about today. Okay? Impossible and financial success. Now, we're going to branch out beyond financial success, but impossible and financial excess. Success. So... I'm going to give you a few more. I'm going to give you some more examples of impossible. Okay? One is Matthew chapter 17, verses 24 through 27. And what happens here, Jesus sends Peter fishing. They need to pay taxes. And he says, you know what, Peter? You go down, and the first fish you catch, there's going to be a piece of money in his mouth. Take it out and pay your taxes for me and thee. And don't forget I said the first fish because I'm hungry. Now, we think, well, yeah, I've heard that story a thousand times. And it's not uncommon that fish swallow things that people fall, you know, they drop and fall into the water. Yeah, I get that. But see, what is impossible? Jesus said the first one is going to have the money in it. Because the fish had been directed to bite the hook. That's impossible. But yet it happened. And Jesus told him what to do, told Peter what to do. And he did it, and that's what happened. 2 Kings chapter 6, verses, excuse me, chapter 6, verses 18 through 23. Elisha ends up being surrounded by an army and prays, and the army is struck blind. The entire army, they can't see. So Elisha leads them back to Samaria where the king of Israel is, and the king of Israel says, shall I fall fall upon them and kill them? And Elisha goes, absolutely not. Give them food and water, and then turn them loose to go back to their king. 
they were struck blind. That's impossible, isn't it? A whole army? But they were struck blind. In 1 Samuel chapter 17, verses 50 through 53, and this is just a, a few little verses, but David defeats Goliath in this story. I know it's much more than three verses, but stay with me. Just read the whole chapter. But that's amazing that a little kid, yeah, but he was very skilled with the stone. Yeah. Is he? Was he? Right place, right time, under the anointing. And what did David say? Well, you're coming to me with a shield, a spear. I'm coming to you in the name of the Lord. So where was his dependence? He was in the spirit of God. Five stones, we know that he sunk one in Goliath's head, and Goliath had four brothers. So I'm ready for him if they show up. But see, isn't it that this little kid who should have been afraid like the other army that was trembling stood up and did what he did? That's impossible, but it happened. And he killed Goliath. That should have been impossible. Goliath was 13 feet tall. A giant that should have stomped David into the dust was dead like that. David, trying to raise the sword up, chops his head off and picks his head up saying, we are victorious. And the Philistines run away. And then Israel chases them because suddenly they're infused with confidence over an impossibility. Joshua chapter 6, verses 1 through 21. Jericho's walls came down. They've excavated those walls, and the walls were pushed down flat to the surface of the ground. They're whole. They were pushed down. That's impossible. But it happened. It's impossible. Right? No? Possible? You can do that? No. But see, God did all these things. In John chapter 15, verse 15, Jesus is transfigured before three different disciples. He was transformed. That's impossible. But he was. In Exodus 16, Israel is, they're angry with God, and they're saying, oh, we, we're tired of eating this manna which is a miracle in itself. But God blew in and covered the camp in quail that evening, and they had meat to the full. That's impossible. Right? You know, it's more possible. You may not know this, but a lot of people, they, they don't really teach on this, but the manna that uh, they ate, they ate that manna for 40 years. He was available for 40 years, and we're concerned God can't feed us. They ate it for 40 years. Not a week, not a month, 40 years. Go to chapter 16 of Exodus and look at verse 35, and it said the children of Israel ate that manna for 40 years. Amazing, isn't it? Now, the children of Israel also, this is, this is when uh, uh, Moses went to the rock and he struck the rock with wa and the water gushed out. The water supplied millions of people and animals gushing out of that rock. Well, that happened twice, not once. This isn't where Moses, he did exactly what God told him to do here. God said, strike the rock. He struck it and the water flowed out. That's right here in Exodus. But in Numbers 20... Moses was told to speak to the rock. And he didn't, and he struck the rock, and the water flowed out, and God said, you didn't do what I told you to do. You're not going into the promised land. But the issue here, the water flowed out of the rock and supplied the thirst of, thousands, of, of millions of Jews, their families, and their animals. That's impossible. They're in a desert. How is water going to flow out of a rock? Well, I have a question. How does water flood the earth? Because that's impossible, but yet it happened. And see, what they're discovering now is that the earth inside itself have bodies of water larger than our oceans. And so if you'll remember, the word of God says the depths in the earth broke up and sprayed upward. The depths in the earth. 
and that assisted in the rain and flooded the earth. If all the water that we know of right now that's on the surface is melted, it's 22 feet above the highest peak in the earth. 22 feet. I think that calculation is a miracle. <laughs> but this is impossible. And she so say, well, no, it's in the Bible. But see, here's, here's your problem. Here's my problem. We've accepted those stories as true fairy tales. Not true says in God can still do that. Yes, God did that, and you believe he did that. But he's not doing that today. He's not doing that in my life. Genesis chapter 6 through 9, Noah's Ark, that's a miracle. Took 125 years, basically, to build that ark. Can you imagine being consistent for 125 years? Built the ark. All the animals came automatically, two by two. Okay? You know, has anybody ever been to that, uh, the ark that they've built up in uh, Kentucky? Okay, well, Ran and the kids and I, we went one year, and uh, it is big, it's vast, it's huge. There's no way eight people could, this is my opinion, there's no way eight people can sustain the work on the ark to keep it going, much less store enough food, water for all those animals, remove the waste, eat for themselves, sleep and rest. It's just not possible. It's not possible. It's bigger than an ocean liner. I personally believe that the animals went and they hibernated. Because there's nothing worse than how did the snake get out and get into the bedroom? Oh, gross. Because suddenly there's one snake. God, we need another one. Why? Because we killed it. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? But you get the idea. So that's a miracle, isn't it? But that's a fairy tale. But yet your God did that. See, it's not impossible. We have to stop thinking like they're impossible. We've got to stop teaching these stories like they're impossible. We have to say, and your God did that, and he does that today. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He does not change. He was miraculous then. He is miraculous now. So let me flip back over here. There's something interesting here, Matthew chapter 6, and we're going to need to go over there. I'm going to show you some things because we're going to talk about primarily prosperity at this point. But see, prosperity is more than money. You need to have peace with your increase. You know what I'm saying? But in Matthew chapter 6, and I've read this to you before, it says, Lay not up for yourself treasures upon the earth where moth doth corrupt and where thieves break through and steal but lay up for yourself treasures in heaven where moth nor uh, rust doth corrupt where thieves do not break through and steal now I, I, the more I look at this you're saying God don't lay up what he's saying is he's, he's showing a tendency to dependence on what you've stored okay that's what he's talking about he's saying get your supply from the kingdom of God where there's no shortages. There's no thieves to break through and steal. In the earth, there's endless thieves. Scams on telephones, bank accounts, stock market. Thieves are everywhere, and they're breaking through and stealing every single day. God is trying to show them a change in their heart. If God needs a million dollars, surely he's got to have someone that has it. So somebody had to put that up in excess, did they not? So it's actually, I believe this is a dependence problem, not a laying up problem. He's saying these people are laying up because they need, and we'll find the context as you read on, of why laying up in this mental capacity is dangerous. Now here's one thing. If the Spirit of God is not your source, you've laid up your entire lives, and then your retirement is lost, like in this, this last this last fiasco in the uh, electronic, or excuse me, not in the electronics world, but in the uh, uh, digital coin market, FTX or whatever that was called, where people lost hundreds of thousands, millions, and even billions of dollars. Well, that retirement's gone. Well, you're 85 years old. What do you do? 
Well, see, you're in a pretty hopeless situation now because your source was not the kingdom. You didn't receive your input, your increase from the kingdom, so now you're limited to the world. And that's a pretty hopeless situation, isn't it? And that's what I'm trying to relate to you. Verse 21 says, for where your treasure is, and this treasure literally means wealth or deposits, where your deposits are. It says, there your heart will be. Now it says, the light of the body is the, is the eye, and therefore if your eye, flip through there, be single or generous, your whole body shall be full of light. But if thine eye is evil or stingy, your whole body should be full of darkness. Now see, when you're laying up, you're going to be stingy. Uh -uh, I'm getting older. I'm not going to give like I used to give. I'm not going to do this. I'm not going to do that. I, I've related to you this way. Payday, you get your money. You got a pocket full of money. You're generous with all your friends. Well, now it's three days till payday. You don't have enough money for gas. One of your friends asks for something. You say, well, do it yourself. I'm not going to help you. I got to put gas in my truck. I got to do this. Suddenly, you're focused on your needs. And your attitude totally changes. Before, you were generous. Oh, yeah, I'll get that for you. Yeah, I'll help you with that. Yes, I'll do this. Now it's no, no, no. Well, what changed? You had abundance before, and you saw it trickling away. And suddenly, because you see it trickling away, you're not generous with it anymore. It's the attitude of your heart concerning the deposit or the wealth. It's not the wealth. The wealth is an evil. It's the love for it. Okay. It says, no man can serve two masters. That's the problem. Now, how rich was Abraham? So rich that in an entire area, he was richer than a king. He and Lot had to separate because they were so wealthy. And if he's so wealthy, he had silver, he had gold, he had cattle, he had lands. Did he store up? Well, it was stored up, but it happened because God said, wherever you place your foot is yours. You're going to be highly favored in this land. The blessings of God are going to come on you, and they're going to overtake you. And that's what happened. His abundance didn't come from him storing up. His abundance came from the blessings of God. And there's a difference. This doesn't mean go give all your money away. That's just silly. It means just simply follow, the God, follow God in the administration of that money. But I'm going to give you a spiritual principle that works with your faith, whether it's healing, whether it's prosperity, it's everything. It doesn't matter. So let's read on a little farther. <clears throat> He begins to talk about the fowls of the air. And he says, they don't gather into barns nor reap. But he said, your heavenly father feeds them and you're, not, and you're much better than them. He said, I'm taking care of them. Why wouldn't I take care of you? Because that's not what you're used to. That's not what you're programmed to. You're not programmed to depend on anyone but yourself. And God says, that's a trap. He's given us a a faith blueprint that we can use to get our needs met. Okay. When you need healing in your body and you go to the doctor and they say, hey, we can't help you. Okay. What do you do? If you're going to be subject to the medical community, and I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that. The devil didn't invent medicine, didn't invent doctors. But that's a that and, and I don't want people to take this wrong but it is a carnal manifestation of what God can do on the spiritual level so what happens is we move closer to our doctors or where we get the best treatment and that's where we live our lives because we're dependent on those things instead of using those things and building our faith along the way where we've used the medical community taken that step and now we can be healed with our faith. We didn't do that. We've depended on the other, the health community carnally. And because we did that, that's what you're limited to. You understand? 
if I use the banking system, but I'm also using my faith to build financial independence, and I'm doing it through godly principles, what happens is I outgrow the need for the banking system. Do you understand? It's not a matter of not needing them. It's we will eventually come to the point where we outgrow the need for them, and we will lend to many nations and not borrow. It's a growth process. Okay. Um, he talks about the grass of the field. He talks about the lilies. He said, they just, the lilies are beautiful. He said, Solomon wasn't arrayed like one of them. And he said, what about the grass on the earth? It's beautiful. And he said, it, eventually its end is to be cast into the furnace. And he said, yet in all its beauty and all its splendor, it's not you. And all that is taken care of. Why can't you believe that I can take care of you? They ate manna for 40 years, people. The Jews were given manna for 40 years. What happened to the shoes on their feet? They didn't wear out. When it was cold in the desert, God was a pillar of fire. When the sun tried to beat down on him, he was a cloud. See, this stuff is not impossible. It's a growth process. But you have, to, you have to receive that God does love you, he does care about you, and he's not going to change regardless of what you do. God loves to the nth degree the most horrible murderer in history, whoever that turned out to be. God still loves them right now. Now, you may have a problem with that, but that's carnal thinking. That's not spiritual thinking. Because God is love, and he's not willing that any perish, but all come to a change of mind and be saved. Okay. He said, for all these things, what you're wearing, what you need to eat, what you need to sustain yourself, he said, all these things the Gentiles, those without me, seek. That's what he's telling you. Your heavenly Father already knows you have to have all this stuff. Now, here's what I want. Look at me. God already knows you need money. He already, needs, he already knows you need a house to live in. You need electricity. You need clothes. You need food. He already knows this. Realize it. Realize God already knows. Accept the fact that he knows. Have you ever done that? Well, God doesn't know that, doesn't he know that I have bills to pay? And he already knows. He already knows. You need to really accept that. God does know. And God does care. And God is saying, I will meet those needs. Accept that. That's your base. That's your base. He said, but I want you to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Seek me. Build that, get that relationship with me. Get that right standing going in your life the right standing that God supplies and then the grace of God engages and all these things and it uses the word added see that it said once you've established your relationship with me and accepted my right standing all these things are added to you now the interesting thing about this word added it's the word T-I-T-H-E-M-I and it means or it's actually a form of a root word called Theo, T-H-E-O now the thing about this Theo, it says indicates a passive horizontal position God's saying I don't need your help to make you rich I don't need your help to put health back in your body. I don't need your help to inject you with youth. I don't need your help to give you peace. I don't need your health or help to give you whatever it looks like you're lacking. I just need you to believe. So the word that says added, it says God passively, you being passive and horizontal meaning laid down, not vertical, which means standing up. God is saying, I'm going to bring these things upon you. It's a spiritual principle. 
But just like the Jews, the church, having shunned God's righteousness, have gone around to establish their own righteousness. I believe that's Romans chapter 10. He said, accept my righteousness. Seek the kingdom and achieve my righteousness. Receive my righteousness. And then all these things are freely coming to you. Just like you believe God is good, just like you believe that God already knows you have needs, and he's saying he'll supply them, he knows the needs, receive it. He said they'll come upon you and overtake you. Receive it. Deuteronomy 28 gives us the blessings and the curses, right? Well, the blessings go through 13. Everything else in that chapter is a curse, which goes, what, 50-some-odd verses, 60-some-odd verses? Uh -huh. But only 13 are blessings. But it said, blessed is the fruit of your body. And they go, yeah, I want my children to be blessed. No, 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 no. He said, blessed is the fruit of your body. That's not just your offspring. That's your body. He said, I'll bless your cattle, what you're growing in the field. He's even made us promises that we'll live in houses we didn't have to build, eat from vineyards we didn't have to plant. God knows that you have need of these things. But he's, and it says, if you hearken diligently into the voice of the Lord your God and observe to do all the commandments, that's Deuteronomy 28, what's the commandment of the New Testament? What's the commandment of the New Testament? Believe on him whom I have sent. Yes, he did say, love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, and might, and your neighbors yourself. But he also said that before he died to a Jew, and that was under the law. You're, it's not capable for you to love God with all your heart, mind, and might. First John tells us, chapter 4, we love God because he first loved us. You understand? God's not looking to you for anything to improve in, or provide the increase. He's looking for you to just use the faith channel so he can bring the increase. Why can't we just accept that? We can. 30, 34 says, Therefore take no thought for the morrow, for the morrow will take thoughts of the things for itself. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. Interesting, right? So let's go back to Theo again. So it says that Theo here is a passive horizontal position. God doesn't need your help. He only needs you to believe. So, that was before I wrote these questions down. And it says, or, or this, this idea, what if I had no idea of how to make my life successful in any area, but I knew that God did, and I asked him to make me successful and just believed it? Would it happen? Yes. You've got to remember, this is me. I want things as simple and broken down to as base as they can be so they cannot be misunderstood. God's good. The devil's bad. Right? So if I can simply believe, then God will do it. If God promised it, and I want it, and I claim it, and I just simply believe, God can do it. I'm reading you the verses that are telling you it's that simple. Now this word added has some other meanings. It means to place additionally, to lay beside, to annex, to add, again, give more, increase. Okay? First Timothy chapter 4. Go over to First Timothy. In First Timothy chapter 4, I'm going to start reading in verse 6. No. Verse 7. It says, But refuse profane and old wives' fables, and exercise thyself rather unto what? Godliness. Look at me. Guys, what's godliness? It's righteousness. See, you're thinking that's works, but that's not what he's talking about. 
You are incapable of fulfilling the law. So you cannot become godly due to works. Paul said it's an impossibility. No one's going to be justified by works of the law. He said it's not possible. It's not going to happen. But he says right here, for us to do what? Oh, that we should exercise ourselves to godliness. It says, for bodily exercise profiteth little, or it's of only of little benefit, but it says godliness is profitable to all things. Now this word profitable is E-P-H-E-L-I-M-O-S. It means advantageous or profitable. So interesting. But godliness is advantageous. There's an advantage to godliness. What's godliness? Receiving the righteousness of God, seeking the kingdom, receiving his righteousness, so all these things, you get the advantage of it. All the things that you're seeking after will be added to you. There's an advantage to being godly. Not works. Godliness is not works. It's belief. Sin is irrelevant. Now, there are consequences for bad decisions. No one ever said there wasn't. But they do not affect your righteousness. You may murder, but you're still righteousness if you receive Jesus. Now, the religious community may have a problem with that, but read your Bible. You're supposed to be believing according to what it says, not what you think or what someone told you, and it just sounds right. That's our problem. That's why we're such failures. We're living by what we're feeling, and we've allowed our feelings to become facts, and the Word of God is the truth. And that's a fact. Jesus examined it and he said, Father, thy word is truth. So Jesus said it was. I choose to believe what he said was right. Now, because I've chosen to believe that, the expanse of the promise and all that it covers is at my disposal by faith. Keep reading. So godliness is profitable unto all things having promise of the life that now is, in other words, here and in the life which is to come. It's profitable all things here and in the life to come. That's what it says, okay? This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation. Accept. Accept. Listen, accept it. Don't try to qualify for it. Accept it. Permit yourselves to receive. Permit yourselves to receive. For therefore we both labor and suffer reproach. We trust in the Lord God, who is the Savior of all men. Go to 14. It says, Neglect not the gift that is in thee, Timothy, which is given thee by prophecy with the laying on of hands of the presbytery. Meditate upon these things. Give thyself wholly over to them, to all these promises to this godliness. And what was the reason? It says, that thy profiting may appear to all, or in all things. Now this word profiting, it means, let me find it here. Because I wrote it down. It's, Sorry, but I have notes all over this page. It's P-R-O-K-O-P-E. And it means that it may that you may increase, that you may profit. Hmm, interesting. That people may see the increase and the profiting in your life. Your health, your bank account, your peace of mind, your favor. Give yourself wholly to the promise. In other words, don't rely on what you can do. Rely on what I've done through Jesus. God's saying, rely on me and what I've done through Jesus. Don't rely on what you can do. Because if you do, you're limited to what you can do. God says, I'm unlimited. All things are possible if you can believe it. interesting. Psalms 37. Psalms 37. Oops. 
Word of God. In Psalms 37, verse 4, it says, Delight thyself in the Lord, and he shall give you the desires of your heart. So God's also promising to give you right desire. Desire to work hard. See, when you desire something, you're working, you're working hard, but because the desire's there, it's not an agony, it's not a drudgery. You understand? You know that. Now, that's not all he says. And he will give you the desires of your heart. Now, listen, he'll give you the desire for good things and then manifest that same desire. He'll give you the desire to achieve and then lead you into that achievement. God does it all. See, when God made the covenant with, with, with the New Testament church through Christ, he didn't ask you to supply your part, which is normal for a covenant. You know what I mean? Usually they made covenant because this person had a benefit, this person had a benefit, they got together, and both of them had the benefit of both. God didn't ask for your benefit because there wasn't any. He said, I will, I will, I will. God's not looking for you to qualify for it, to achieve it, to deserve it. He's looking at you to receive it. He's coveted with you because you needed it. And because he loves you, he wants to give you what you need. Well, you're saying we just need to take advantage of God. Yes, that's exactly what I'm telling you. That's exactly what I'm telling you. There is no greater praise, no greater worship than for God to give you everything you want. Oh, you're crazy. Am I? I didn't go out here in the world and God's giving me the desires of my heart, right? So I'm not getting it through stepping on someone else and stomping them. I'm not getting it through sexual perversion. I'm getting it through releasing my faith in God's promises, and God gives it all. And that, and that dependence on him, that believing in him, gives, it, it gives God greater praise than anything. See, we're looking at things all wrong. We're looking at things being limited and, you know, God, I don't want to, there's a song, and they don't mean ill by it, and I'm not trying to say that, but they said, God, I'm, I don't want to abuse your grace, and God is saying, but I want you to. I don't want there to be a single need in your life, a single torment in your emotions, nothing. And my grace is sufficient for you. So you just take it and take it and take it. It's unlimited. It never runs out. You're not going to go wrong. You're depending on the kingdom and God as the source. You're not going to fail. You're not going to go off the rails. You're not going to take a left. Or like Bunny would say, I should have taken that ride at Albuquerque. People don't even know who Bugs Bunny is anymore. Do you see that type of thinking? Do you see why that's relevant? We're taught... Oh, that's humble. No, that's stupid. Sorry. That's just dumb. I'm not asking to get something through through perversion. I'm getting it with my faith. And see, the interesting thing is faith has that chain reaction. Peace. Right, Paula? And see, there should be a pay a, a peace in us realizing we're not trying, we don't we're not accomplishing it. We we don't have to be relied on to accomplish it. And that should be a huge release relief to us but I don't know about you but all my life I've been taught if it's hard that's the way God wants you to go well I'm going to tell you the harder it gets the more I'm going to avoid God because that's a natural reaction God says my yoke is easy my burden is light come after me I'm your sugar daddy I'm a sugar daddy for all my kids I want you to have everything that pertains to life and godliness. Just get it through me. Don't get it through the world. Just get it through me. So money, giving, how, how does that work? Well, it works this way. Give and it will be given unto you. But give by your led by the Spirit of God. Give as you purpose in your heart. 
Now, I see that many different words, ways, and I haven't looked up the word purpose, but to me, it doesn't mean that as I purpose in my heart, it means like I need, I need to be of a willing heart, give it of a willing heart, and I'm only going to become willing as I understand God is not subtracting, he's multiplying to my life, okay? I don't give away my rent money, my electric bill money, and people on TV that ask you to do that, I'm sorry. I just have a problem with that. I just think that's wrong. I, I, that is just wrong. Or to say that there's a 10% maximum or, excuse me, minimum, I don't see that in the New Testament. There's mentions of tithes and things like that, but they're not mentioned that the church is to necessarily engage in those things because if it was so, Paul never taught it. I know in Hebrews that they bring up the tithe and that it was given by Abraham to Melchizedek, but that was to put the importance in the Jews' mind of how important Melchizedek was, who is a representation of Jesus. We've taken it to mean, well, Jesus is a representation of the church, so our tithe needs to go to the church. But there's not actually a teaching like that in the New Testament. Did you know that? I went and looked. Paul, when he was taking up uh, the, uh, uh, the collection for the poor Jews in Jerusalem, he said, give and it would be given unto you in good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over would mean, well, actually, that's Luke 638. I'm sorry, that one automatically comes up. He said, you give sparingly, you'll reap sparingly. Give bountifully, you'll reap bountifully. He's saying, as you, have be, as you are believing, so give. That's the law of the New Testament. But God is going to lead you to give. So, read another verse here in 37, verse 5. It says, commit thy way unto the Lord. Commit your life unto the Lord. Trust in him, and he'll bring it to pass. Huh. What's it going to bring to pass? Godliness and the advantages of it. That's what we're talking about, right? Psalms 55. Verse 22. Cast thy burden, and that burden is gift. Uh, cast thy gift unto the Lord, and he shall sustain thee. He shall never suffer your righteousness to be moved. What I want you to see is the sustaining, the gift, the righteousness, they're always mentioned together. They're always mentioned together. What's he going to do? He's going to sustain your righteousness, right? What is righteousness? the right standing God provides, the favor of, that God provides. What's your gift? Whatever he's laid in your heart to give. But who, who does he say he's going to do all that? You give, he does the rest. Cast thy burden upon the Lord and he will sustain. What's this sustain means? Supply you. He will supply you. He will maintain you. That's what the word means. James chapter 4. Flip over to James. Because I've got to make sure I get these scriptures in. I know a lot of times that I'm quoting scriptures, I'm giving them to you, and you have to go look them up. And when I'm relaying a lot of information, that's just the best way for me to do it. And it helps you go back and looking them up. It, it, it solidifies those things in you. But in Matthew chapter 6, excuse me, chapter 4, verse 6, it says, but he that giveth more grace, but he giveth more grace. Wherefore, what? Wait, what do you say? He says, but he giveth more grace. So listen, wherefore he giveth more grace. Why? Why does he do that? What's grace? It's unmerited favor. It's established by your righteousness, but he giveth more grace. Wherefore, he saith, God resists the proud, but giveth grace to the humble. Right? He gives more grace to the humble, but he resists what? The proud. Who's the proud? I'm going to lay it up. I'm going to do it myself. I'm going to depend on me because I can't depend on anyone else. That's the proud. Pride comes before the fall. But he said he gives grace to the humble. Okay? God's unmerited favor means God's blessing is poured out on you whether you deserve it or not. But he said he does it to the humble. 
So it sounds to me like we need to get a, a, a definition of the terms, okay? Humble means submissive. It means to reduce self-dependence. Whoops! Go look at Mr. Webster Dictionary. Interesting, right? Submissive. Submitting to what? Godliness. Submitting to the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things will be added to you. See, there is a financial supply plan. It does involve you giving your life away. You already did that. It doesn't, and when I say, it doesn't involve giving all your finances away. If God wants you to do something like that, he will have already put it in your heart and you'll know. There won't be this, should I do it? Is God talking to me? Or, Throw that stuff away and walk away. Don't, don't, don't do that. God does not come to break anyone. God comes to manifest the blessing. Okay. <clears throat> so let's read on. He said he gives grace to the humble. So the humble is the submissive, the reduced independence. But there's also something else it means. To humiliate. What? Hu what? What? Yeah. To humiliate. Now listen. Humiliate means to humble oneself to put in a lower condition. A place of dependence. So humble and humiliate are similar. You mean humiliate means to just expose you out there and to make you look ridiculous. Well, in the sense of you following God, that may be true. Well, you're, you're a crackpot. You're a radical. So be willing to be humiliated, to be reduced to another state. But that's not necessarily how I'm seeing this. If I'm going to follow the flow of the scriptures, that humiliate means that I'm going to take a step down and stop trying to do it myself and depend on someone else. His name is God. He did it through his son, Jesus Christ. That's, to me, what humiliation is. I'm humiliating myself. I'm humbling myself. I'm depending on someone else. Verse 7. It says, submit yourself, therefore, to who? God. So he's telling you what this word humble means. It means being submissive. Submit yourself to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee. Resist means refuse to comply. Submit to God and don't comply with the devil. That's what he's telling you there. Romans chapter 2. Romans chapter 2. Verse 4. Well, I better read thee. Oh, hmm. No, I'm just going to read verse 4. Or despisest thou the riches of his goodness and the forbearance of his long suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leads thee to repentance? What's going to cause someone to change? Goodness. Goodness. God's goodness. That's what's going to cause you to change. You want to change your mind about finances? Then understand God does know you need those things, and he has a plan. And I'm showing you what the plan is. That he said, all these things that you think you need that you have to watch after so closely, and we're not saying be sloppy with your lifestyle, spend all your money. Nobody's saying that. We're saying follow the Spirit of God in what you're doing. Seek first the kingdom and his righteousness and follow his leadership. Depend on him to supply your needs. Because when you do that, you'll never lack when the world lacks. Remember Goshen and the ten plagues? All those things were happening in Egypt, but they weren't happening in Goshen. They didn't have a lice and frog problem. They didn't have hail that burned on the ground. Their water didn't turn into blood. They didn't have those problems. Because God divided his people from the world and he got their needs supplied. God can divide you from the world and make sure that you never lack. Well, you know, does that mean I'm going to have to go through hard times and all this and that I'm never really going to have enough? No, I'm telling you, that's not God's way and that's not how it works. 
That's not the process. It didn't work that way for Father Abraham. Didn't work that way for Solomon. The Jews are the most sex, successful people in the earth. More invention, more intellectual prowess. Why? Because they believe they're blessed of God. They believe they're supposed to succeed. So you're supposed to believe in those promises that they're supposed to work for you. They're supposed to manifest for you. They're supposed to open the doorways for you. Is that actual time? Okay, I'm just gonna. I just have a few more, a few more verses. Okay, First Peter five verse six. It says, "You humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that He may exalt you in due time." Wow, verse six says, "Exalt." Exalt means to elevate you altitude and to lift up so he's telling you be submissive depend on the kingdom transition to the kingdom grow out of your need you see you don't just throw medicine down I'm never going to tell you to do that never ever but what you do is you simply you're going to outgrow one position into the next position you're going to grow out of the carnal level into the spiritual level as you renew your mind. And all of that will just become natural. A natural way of doing things. And what happens in the world is not going to scare you. Psalms 46, and then we're going to close. See, when, when, you, when you come into the church, when you come here to hear a message, there should never be a negative fearful tormenting message that shipwrecks your faith and kicks your faith legs out from under you should never ever happen if God's going to correct you he'll do that and then build you back up and say hey let's don't do that let's do this that's not the direction I want you to go so stop going that way and let's go this way because this is what's going to happen okay so 46, verse 10. Be still and know that I am God. Now, if you want to go through and read the 46th Psalm, there's lots of upheaval, physical upheavals and things and disasters occurring. And he says, hey, be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the heathen and I will be exalted in the earth. He says, be still and know that I am God. I've got you. All these things may look like they're coming apart. Everything's being overthrown. Everything's being vomited out. But he says, I am God. Be still and know that I am God. See, there's another scripture that also says, be still. Not, and it's, not, it's not be still. It's, uh, oh gosh, the battle is the Lord's. And that occurs when the children of Israel, they're going out against these groups of armies that are coming against them, and they send the praisers out. And he said, send the praisers out in front of everybody. And what happens? Those armies turn on themselves and destroy themselves. And Israel is delivered, right? And no one fought. He said, I'm going to battle for you. See, your faith in God's word allows God's word to battle for you. The shield of faith, it's not you that's like, I'm so bad in all my armor. It's that shield that's so bad, you know, and I'd say, it's good. I don't want to use those terms. It's good. It's that shield that's quenching every fiery dart. And notice it said, everyone? None get past it. So, as you're engaging in faith, you can't be harmed by a fiery dart. There may be an evil report, but your faith will grow to cover that dart. It'll shape itself to you and to your conditions. So God has a financial plan. 
this is kind of it in a rushed way, but I think, I think you see it and you get it. And this is how it fits with everything. God is harmonious in all that he does. He cares about you. He knows what you need. He's not silly, some senile old man. He's the most high God. He knows that you have need of it. And he said, I've already got a plan. And see, your plan is going to keep you stuck in the world and dependent on them. Mine will cause you to grow out of that system into a faith system where I'll manipulate the world to your benefit. Stand up, everybody. Because our God shall supply all our needs according to his times. And I was corrected this morning by my daughter and my son and Jane. (laughs) And I just walked out of the room and walked down the hall and said, they just need to shut up. (laughs) Just kidding. I didn't say that. But when you're looking, when you, when you're looking at society, when you're looking at different things and I'll just tell you what happened Jessica was showing a video of a song that she wanted us to go back and sing and it's my God is an awesome God and the uh, teachers and the students in the class were doing it you know Acapulco (laughs) yeah it's okay to laugh I know I I know what I said anyway but my my perception of what I saw is yes God is an awesome God and I looked at Jane and you know uh, I'm not sure Jeremy was up here at that necessarily at that time but Jessica was. Were you up there, Jeremy? No? Okay. Well, anyway, I, I looked at him and I said, and you know what the shame of all that is? They don't believe a word they're saying. They're excited. Yes, our God is an awesome God. But when they walk right outside and they're hit with the world, they fold. And it's 